All right, so I will introduce our speaker here, Robert Quinn from Michigan State University. So I've you know Rob for a long time. We were at uh, grad school together at the university as well. Uh, and so he also did his undergraduate degree there. Uh, and But he did his uh, master's as well, and then moved on to a PhD at uh, University of Louisiana, right? Uh, and from there, moved out to sunny California to uh, UC San Diego, uh, working with uh, Peter Dorsey, uh, getting into all kinds of uh, microbiome stuff. Uh, he's done some interesting work in the past on cystic fibrosis, which he's going to uh, be telling us today. But he's also worked on other things, like in the, in the gut system, for instance, with bile acid processing. So he's done a lot of cool microbiome stuff. And today he's going to tell us more about his cystic fibrosis work. Yeah. Thanks, Daryl. Okay, so this is the obligatory uh, title slide that will show. But my title slide, assuming that I can show it oh might be just del super delayed is sort of part of the story so um this image i'm showing here my talk is a reference to a book how many people kind of got the reference yeah you've got half the audience usually um you know i try to approach this sort of clinical problem of my infections and cystic fibrosis from a microbial ecology, uh, maybe even natural history perspective, which is kind of where I get this name from. But maybe more importantly, this image here is showing um, depiction uh, of cystic fibrosis disease by a fellow named Dylan Mortimer, who is a CF patient and also an artist. He makes these incredible images. Uh, this picture is actually the size of this wall. It's made with rhinestones and sequins. And he's this incredible artist. So I encourage you to check out his website, DylanMortimer.com. Um, you know, a lot of this work is about helping people like Dylan. We use microbiome metabolomic approaches to do some really um, clinical science. And we're very close to, to the patients with a lot of this work. And it's sort of a unique aspect of cystic fibrosis that I really like. Um, I'll talk quickly about the microbiome. Well, this is not going to be news to this audience, that we truly are a walking ecosystem. All right. So in any person walking around the planet today made of approximately 30 trillion cells. Now, in and on those uh, 30 trillion cells, anyway, you could turn the light down a bit. Back, I'm a black background guy. Awesome, that was great. So, or 40 trillion bacteria. So by this measure, and we'll debate to the end of the earth whether, what the exact ratio is, and it probably depends whether or not you went to the bathroom in the morning, right? Um, but one to one ratio of host to, to microbial cells, and that's surprising to many people, although probably not to you guys. But what's particularly interesting is if you look at the level of genes. So the human uh, genome is made of approximately 20,000 genes. Estimates of the genetic diversity of the human microbiome are on the order of 600,000 genes. So by this measure, we're 30 to 1 micro. And this really matters because for the most part, you can't change your genome. You're stuck with what you got. Some of us more blessed than others. Now, we could argue CRISPR-Cas systems will allow us to kind of tweak things here and there that we don't necessarily like. But for the most part, you're stuck with what you got. To change your microbiome every day. And Daryl was telling me about how you can change your microbiome depending on the type of starch that you eat. If you choose uh, the breakfast I had this morning was a lot of bacon and eggs compared to you know, your granola versus um, yogurt. If you make that choice more often than not, you have a different microbiome because they're responding to that input uh, and you can change that. So my lab and surely you guys believe as well, there's a lot of power behind this, this understanding that we can manipulate our microbiomes for health and to help understand disease. But this is not only about humans. It's not only about the gut. Um, all multicellular organisms host a microbiome. And all of these images I'm actually showing that I've done work on, including coral reefs, which I hope to talk to some people about that today, fish, insects, trees, crustaceans, and of course, mice, all host a microbiome. It's very much a, uh, an aspect of multicellular life, is that you are multicellular not only in your own right, but or interacting with other microbes. This isn't necessarily new, the Human Microbiome Project, you know, 10 years ago, and really we've known this for a long time, but the HMP, the NIH decided it was very much worth funding, but $173 million were spent to essentially sequence the human microbiome about 10 years ago. Now we have a good census of who these microbes are and where they are, but we still don't know a lot about what they do, particularly how they interact with us. So 
a lot of what my lab actually does is um, we look at chemistry from the microbiome, metabolomics. I'm not going to touch too much on that in the cystic fibrosis story, but it's a lot of what we do and really the kind of census that we have about how the microbiome interacts with our bodies is through four different ways. That'd be through primary metabolite production. So microbes make molecules from their particular core biological pathways that we simply don't have. Short chain fatty acids, some of which are a good example. We don't have the genes to make them. We can pick these things up in our body. We know they're microbial, specialized metabolites. So microbes make a lot of complex chemistry, often uh, derived from complex genetic machinery that's sometimes horizontally transferred. We pick those molecules up in our body as well. And a lot of people intensely study these types of compounds. But what we see the most evidence for really is modification of host molecules and modifications of xenobiotics. So microbes are messing with things that we make and things that we ingest. And really the true purpose, at least in our gut, as far as we can tell, of our microbiome is to digest our food. And that's majorly the signatures that we see when we look at this type of data. But how do we study the metabolome? So metabolomics is a complicated science. It's really based on uh, a couple of methods, NMR or mass spectrometry. Mostly what I do is mass spectrometry, but I wanted to touch a little bit on the type of mass spec that we do. It's uh, kind of unique. So we do untargeted metabolomics using tandem mass spectrometry. Uh, mass spectrometers that are basically just really expensive, really large and very, very accurate scales. They're measuring the mass of molecules. Here is an example of a molecule from Pseudomonas aeruginosa called pyochelin. It's a uh, siderophore produced by the, uh, by the Pseudomonas. We pick this up in the lungs of CF patients readily. The mass spectrometer will tell me that this molecule weighs 324.06 Daltons. And we know that from its chemical structure. And you can see that in what's called a spectrum. So mass spectra, or eventually mass spectrometry, is visualizing the abundance and mass of particular molecules in complex biological samples. In this case, this 325.06 represents pyochelin. It gets ionized. Those details are not really necessary here. But what tandem mass spectrometry does, which is really a, another layer of power in metabolomics that lots of people are doing, is it breaks the molecule apart and measures its pieces. So mass specs can isolate a molecule, break them apart, and we get a spectrum of that particular molecule, kind of like a fingerprint. Well, the reason you do that is because molecules break apart based on their chemical structure. So we get information about the structure. And this is really important for unknowns. So much of the molecules that we detect, we don't know what they are. We can try to decipher their structure through these really kind of fingerprints and patterns in mass spectrometry. It's a lot of what we do. Um, what's an important point to make, and it's sort of, you know, I, I make the point that maybe metabolomics is sort of maybe 20, 25 years, 30 years behind genomics. Uh, we are really, really good at detecting molecules really, really accurately tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands to millions of spectra in a, in a biological experiment we can detect really, really accurately, but we just kind of suck at figuring out what they are. Um, mass spectrometers are incredibly powerful machines, but we really haven't harnessed what they can provide us to, to do the biology that's underlying really what this chemistry is all about. That being said, you know, two to 10% of the molecules we detect in something like a mouse fecal sample, one of these most intensely studied samples on earth, we can't identify 80 to 90% of what the molecules are give you an idea, this dark matter, we call it. So how I got interested in mass specs, I actually did my postdoc with Forrest Rower at San Diego State University. And we came across this paper in 2012 by Peter Dorsey, who was really just up the highway, about something called molecular networking. It reminded me a lot of BLAST. So essentially what molecular networking does, it takes these fingerprints, these mass spectra, and aligns them in actually kind of a complicated way, which really you're just looking for similarity in these fragmentation patterns that indicate molecules have similar structures. So the way we do that then, in this case, you get a hit. So these two molecules are different, but they break apart into similar pieces, indicating they had similar structures. Really, it's a puzzle that we're putting back together. We can score how similar those molecules are, something called a cosine score, similar to a blast, maybe an E value. And then we can relate them in computational space as nodes. Now, where the word molecular networking comes from is this is done on mass. It's really a bioinformatic tool. You can do this in an entire sample, an entire data set, literally in entire databases. We can build molecular networks that visualize and organize chemistry, biological chemistry. And you see molecules that are related kind of cluster together. And it really helps you annotate and organize this very, very uh, complicated mass spectrometry data. This is developed into a revolutionary mass spectrometry tool called GNPS that I won't talk about too much today, but it's truly the driver behind all of the metabolomic work that I do. And I encourage you guys to check it out. It's a freely available uh, database. So that's enough of the technical stuff.
Um, Really, I wanted to talk about cystic fibrosis and the work that we've done in understanding really the microbial ecology of this system. Um, CF is a chronic polymicrobial infection. So patients with this disease, it's actually a genetic disease. The underlying cause is mutations in a gene called CFTR. The responsibility of CFTR is to transport, uh, sorry, CFTR is expressed in the tissue, uh, the epithelium of a number of tissues, particularly the lungs, the gut, a few other places, the pancreas, um, the responsibility of CFTR is to transport negatively charged ions across the membrane. But in CF, patients have mutations in this gene that disrupts that process. Somewhat of a complicated mechanism how this actually happens and somewhat still up for debate. But this leads to the buildup of thick, sticky mucus on the airway surface. So people with CF are born with, with this thick mucus, basically from birth, and they develop these really uh, hard, to, hard to remove uh, mucus through time. As a result, basically from birth, patients with CF become colonized by bacteria. So our lungs, although me being frankly sick as a dog right now, um, have a low bacterial load, if any bacteria. I'll never use the word sterile because that's like a swear word in microbiology, at least in microbial ecology, but they're very, very low microbial load. And our, our lungs do an exceptional job keeping microbes off of them. But in CF, this is disrupted because of this mucus and you get a higher load of bacteria from birth. Over time, they develop this complex polymicrobial infection and it adapts and evolves in the patients over time. There's a lot of work on the actual evolution of the bacterium in the lungs of patients. What's really a, a, an interesting aspect from a scientific perspective, and I've been kind of trying to preach to the microbiome field for a while, I'm not sure if any people are listening, that the CF lung is a fantastic kind of model system for microbiomes, at least in a, in a uh, disease context. Partly, mostly because it's relatively reduced. It's not very diverse. Although people talk about the diversity of the lung microbiome, there's really only 15 to 20 bacteria that get in there of any significant abundance. And the bacteria that are present in the CF lung are some of the best studied microbes on the earth. Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Staphylococcus aureus. We have sequenced genomes for all of them. We can culture all of them. So it's a unique system to understand the interactions between uh, microbes, a microbiome really that shouldn't be there in a way, and your immune system. An important aspect of CF is the requirement for antibiotics. So patients take kilograms upon kilograms of antibiotics throughout their lifetime. And it has really strong selective pressure on microbes that live there. You can imagine the, the damage that it does in their whole microbiome, which we actually just submitted a paper about that. And sadly, CF very much is, is a terminal disease. Patients do subsequently succumb to CF, primarily due to complications from lung infection. But to be even more specific, so the area of the interest I've been particularly working on are something called cystic fibrosis pulmonary exacerbations. So these are very clinical problems, right? We're using uh, microbial ecology and microbiome methods to answer clinical questions that doctors care about. And these are called CFPEs. P patients always have CF, it's a genetic disease, but they periodically get much sicker. We're mostly unsure why. So they have these flares. You kind of see that in their longitudinal plot here where their lung function dips over time. They have these exacerbations. The more they have, the worse they do, and sometimes they die from them. We don't know what causes them. We believe the microbes are involved. Heavy antibiotic therapy is the treatment. Sometimes the patients get better, sometimes they don't. So it kind of shows this poor understanding of the role of the lung microbiome in these events and frankly, what antibiotics even do. We don't mostly don't know. They're given to the patient. They kind of wait seven days, see how they're doing. Sometimes the patient reports feel better. Sometimes they don't, and they'll change the therapies. But I like to think of myself as a good practicing microbial ecologist. So when I first came to CF, so my PhD in Louisiana was actually on lobsters. So I did a lot of marine kind of uh, uh, aquatic microbe stuff before I came to CF. And I was thinking sort of from classic microbial ecology, when reading about cystic fibrosis, you hear about these mucus-plugged bronchioles. So these are things that happen in our lungs, and I think my bronchioles are pretty plugged right now, actually. What you can see here is a histological section through a bronchiole, and this blue staining material is mucus. This is a characteristic of all chronic lung diseases, including the acute one I'm experiencing right now. <coughs> um, you get these plugs. Now, thinking like a microbiologist or microbial ecologist, this is kind of how I visualized the system when I started my postdoc in Forest Rovers Lab in San Diego. Um, you get these plugged tubes that are basically thin tubes full of mucus, and in that mucus are bacteria. So from our first principles of understanding microbiology, we could postulate that this will almost surely set up chemical gradients. 
because we're open to the airway at the top and then plugged mucus through the bottom. Now, what we did in 2014, so quite a while ago now, was a metagenomic study. So the first paper I really published on this disease was just a metagenomic survey. What are the core pathways that these microbes are bringing with them in the lung? We found some, found some interesting things. We see things like denitrification, ferment, fermentation, sulfur reduction, dissimilatory nitrate reduction to ammonia. Not things you hear a lot about in pathogenic microbiology textbooks. Because the reality is that these microbes are dealing similarly with mechanisms and pathways that those out in the environment are, and they bring a lot of the same genes with them. Which led me to realize that perhaps this system isn't all that different than that developed by my hero, Dr. Sergei Vinogradsky in the late 1890s, called the Vinogradsky column. So if you take a microbial ecology class, you'll learn about Sergei and his columns. Basically, he was a Russian scientist who took sediment from a lake and put it in a glass tube next to a window. And he was studying how microbial communities stratify in chemical gradients. We think microbiomes in the CF lung, and in really all microbiomes, have similar stratifications, and we're seeing a lot of evidence for that. Thus, the idea was that to then study this system in a similar way, which led me to create what I call the WinCF model, so an homage to Winogradsky. Um, basically, what we did was take these thin glass capillary tubes that are the same ones you get when you go to the doctor and they take a little spot of blood, filled with a media called artificial sputum media. So it was someone's good idea about 15 years ago to create a microbiological media that mimics sputum, mucus from CF patients. So we fill these little tubes with the media. I was initially adding these colorimetric dyes, visualizing microbial physiology changes in CF samples. Pure cultures, sputum samples, even explant tissues from lungs are going into the system. So the idea then is we plug it at the bottom, we've been open to the air at the top, and we're really trying to do better than a Petri dish, right? So Culturing Pseudomonas aeruginosa in pure culture on a petri dish is like the moon to the microbe. It's not how it exists in the lung. The moon was full of, you know, uh, digested starch and soy and things like that. Um, so we're trying to do a better job of understanding or growing and studying the system in a physiochemical conditions that better mimic where they exist. Probably the most interesting finding, although we're starting to see some cool new stuff as well, with the WinCF system was when I was following a single patient through time. So this cystic fibrosis patient, the reason that my postdoc advisor, Forrest Rohrer, who's a phage and coral scientist, came to study CF is because a CF patient came to him with the idea that phage was going to cure his disease. Ten years later, I show up, and he's still in the lab, and I basically asked him to provide me a, C a sputum sample whenever he could, when he was reasonably able to do that. He subsequently passed away in 2017, sadly. Um, I captured about 40 samples over 200 days, through two separate exacerbation events in this longitudinal N of one study. What I'm showing you here is on the top is the change in pH in the Winogradsky tubes and the amount of gas bubble production. So you can see from this previous picture, we get these bubbles that are actually caught in the tubes and quantify how much gas is produced. What I found is that if you look at the arrows, which are the sample immediately after antibiotics were administered, IV antibiotics for a pulmonary exacerbation, you see this big drop in pH and increase in gas production right before, as the exacerbation kind of reaches its, reaches its apex. Sure enough, it doesn't take a PhD in microbiology to know that low pH in gas is a strong signature of microbial fermentation. And this really led to an entirely new theory about what might be happening in the lungs of these patients when they get sick. One of the great things about omics data that I don't think enough people do is these data sets don't die, right? Like you, you generate a 16S data set or a metagenome. You can't just publish one paper and move on and try to do There's so much information and so many approaches you can take to these data sets. And maybe we should think about going back to them, which is what we did. So we had a colleague from the University of Michigan, John LaPuma, who had published a paper on a 10 year study of six CF patients over time. We were using co-occurrence networking approaches to identify kind of the relationships and structure of the CF microbiome in this data. We politely asked for his help and he was more than willing to do so. What I've shown you here then is the structure of the CF microbiome based on a co-occurrence network. What you're seeing in the, the blue lines are positively co-occurring microbes that are identified from this algorithm from um, Stephanie Vitter at University of Austria. The red lines are negatively interact or negatively co-occurring microbes that don't seem to exist together. Um, what you'll notice is all the blue lines are connecting anaerobes and the red lines are connecting the pathogens to the anaerobes. So there seems to be this kind of mutually exclusive dynamic through time between these two communities, which we think may in fact represent exacerbation and stability, much like we saw in that fermentation. 
So this is much newer data, not yet published. We're starting to see this more and more. If we follow people longitudinally, um, we can see increases. So this is a, about a 35 day time frame up to an exacerbation and through its treatment. You'll see on the X axis with the log ratio of anaerobes to pathogens, like a good microbiome scientist, I'm moving towards using log ratios, the better way to visualize this type of data. And you can really see the increase in the ratio of these anaerobes to pathogens. This actually mirrors diversity as well. The Shannon index is a similar pattern as they approach an exacerbation. So we're seeing this building of diversity, which very much reflects this diverse community of anaerobes as they get sick. So we keep seeing the same thing. Interesting to see that reduction in the, in the ratio as the treatment comes through. Looking at metabolomic data, so we could ask very similar questions with metabolomes, really trying to figure out what that even means. If we do see changes in a metabolome, in this case, we don't actually see much change in the metabolome, which is on the bottom panel here, the diversity of the metabolome. If you look in individual people through time, the reason I showed this slide is that in the CF microbiome literature, there's hot debates about whether the microbiome even changes when they take antibiotics. I don't know what other people are doing because every time I look, it changes dramatically. And I'll show many examples of that. And here's one. Other people argue it's very static. It doesn't change much at all. Look at this individual. This is rank abundances. So again, the compositionality of the data sometimes confuses our way that we can visualize it. If we just look at the rank abundance of microbes, for a 140-day study, we're getting samples basically every day that we could from this individual or doing this in their home. Um, the Pseudomonas is the number one ranked microbe, and it does not change much through time. But in the orange section, the patient got treated with tobermycin and miropenem, and you can see this just wipe out of these particular anaerobes. Um, I think porphyromonas, uh, baladia, prevotella, and vianella get wiped out. But you'll notice after the treatment, about maybe 40 days later, they come back because we think the source of these anaerobic bacteria is the, is the upper airway, the oral cavity. As I'm talking right now, I'm spitting microbes all over all of us, and probably I'll walk home infected with my virus that I think I have. Um, so we think that the CF patients are constantly being inoculated with these oral anaerobes, and that some of them seem to establish and perhaps are involved in exacerbations. So it was a lot of lines of evidence that led to this, and not all that's even just from me in my lab. Um, for what we call the fermentation and exacerbation hypothesis. The idea being that physicians have been missing the story for 80 years in the study of CF microbiology, maybe 90 years. Studying Pseudomonas has led us a lot to understand its role in this disease. But concerning exacerbations, we are seeing lots of evidence, uh, particularly and not just by lab, that anaerobes increase when they have an exacerbation and they're killed during treatment. We're not gonna pretend to say that they cause them, but it certainly is an interesting thing to look at. What we think is happening is there is in fact two separate microbial communities in the CF lung. We call them the climax and attack communities. The word climax actually comes from like classical ecology. So like a redwood forest on the coast of California, these deeply evolved, long, hard to perturb ecosystems, which in this case represent the antibiotic resistant pathogens such as Pseudomonas. The attack community, however, are these really poorly understood, ignored microbes. They're not considered pathogens. They're not cultured in clinical labs. They're not screened for antibiotic resistance and they're the anaerobes. Now, when I was thinking about this idea, if you, <coughs> we know that they have different carbon sources. The anaerobes eat sugar and they ferment that sugar. The pathogens eat amino acids, particularly Pseudomonas. There's lots of literature talking about Pseudomonas' preferential metabolism of amino acids in the CF lung and in a lot of conditions. Pseudomonas doesn't even eat, like to eat glucose, which is bizarre for a bacteria. When you do these two different metabolisms, you have a differential effect on the pH of your environment. When you ferment, you lower the pH. When you eat amino acids, you deaminate that amino acid producing ammonia, which raises the pH. So at this point, we're trying to figure out if this is true, that we have this dynamic change. If anaerobes might even cause exacerbations, how might that happen? Perhaps it's driven by pH. So what I did like last year, we published this and um, called the WinCF pH experiments. So we go back to the WinCF system as we learn from the omics data. And I set up a gradient of pH from five to 8.5 by buffering the media. And then we add sputum samples to do this in high replication and culture the community for two days. And we get this kind of response, gas bubbles are produced. And we looking at the microbiome, metabolome and the physiology of the system in this gradient with the idea that could we predict the outcome with an understanding of what I kind of just talked about that at low pH, we'll get lots of anaerobes and at high pH, we should get pathogens. Sure enough, that was the case. What you can see here is a classic microbiome plot in this gradient that represents, you think of each one of these bars as a WinCF tube and the microbes that are in them. 
When you lower the pH, you get this diverse community of anaerobes, Vianella, Prevotella, Streptococcus, things like that. But as you raise the pH, this blue guy shows up, which is Pseudomonas. Notice if you look at the sputum sample, it's like 95% Pseudomonas. When you grow it in the WinCF tubes, you get more anaerobes. But I think what's really interesting about this experiment is if you look at the difference between pH 7 and pH 8, you go from about 70% Pseudomonas to zero. So perhaps we don't even need antibiotics. You know, you can change the pH of a system one unit and completely eliminate what is considered to be the most notorious pathogen of this disease. But you read the literature and this antibiotics are like beating a dead horse. You can't seem to kill Pseudomonas. It's hard to eradicate. We're showing that, you know, if you change the ecology and the chemistry of the system, things start to look very different. <coughs> So I talked early on about this oxygen gradient that I had kind of postulated would exist. Figured it was probably time to show that. So we did a similar experiment looking at oxygen gradients in the CF lung. This was done with help of my kind of super undergrad at UCSD, who is now his PhD at Stanford. Um, we're still trying to mimic this system, these mucus plugged bronchioles. And we have this sort of open air system and we inoculate sputum samples. We do this in high replication. So this was done 19 times because there's a lot of personalization in this disease. People don't always respond the same way. So you need to do an, at pretty large ends. We're growing the microbiome from the sputum samples in the WinCF tubes, but then we freeze the tubes and section down this oxygen gradient. And this is one millimeter section. So pretty kind of crudely done. But what I'm showing you here is this kind of visualization data called ILLI. It's really like fancy heat maps. You can kind of map data onto your experimental system. We've done this for 3D lungs, uh, coral reefs. You can map omics data onto a coral reef. Um, just an easy way to kind of visualize this, this information. We measured the oxygen penetration into the WinCF tubes. We find there are steep oxygen gradients in the system, very much like a biofilm system. The first two millimeters are basically fully oxic with a transition to anoxia in about a 200 micron space between the second and third layer. Again, they're one millimeter sections. So the hypothesis was that oxygen would stratify this community, and sure enough, it does. Um, you see that Pseudomonas, the pathogens, again, these climax and attack communities, the pathogens dominate in the aerobic portions of the tube, and the anaerobes dominate in the anaerobic portions of the tube. Well, Eureka, right? Perhaps this isn't all that surprising. But in a lot of ways, it is surprising. Because if you read the literature about CF, you read about this big bad pathogen, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. It's got a seven megabase pair genome. It produces metabolites that can lyse your neutrophils, kill other bacterial cells, shut down respiration from uh, Staphylococcus. And it is a super nitrifier, an anaerobic growing bacterium. But if we change the pH one unit, unit lower the oxygen concentration, Pseudomonas is gone. It gets outcompeted by what are considered to be benign organisms. We've been arguing that they're far from benign. We think we're getting to understand the system enough that perhaps we can even bring in mathematical modeling. A couple of modelers approached me when I was at this um, kind of a think tank conference thing at, in Cambridge, England, um, that they were interested in expanding from their biofilm models. These uh, came from the um, Biofilm Institute at Montana State University. This is some really, really awesome work. They were interested in kind of getting away from one micro because they've, everybody keeps telling them microbes don't exist alone. So CF was a good place to look. And what we've started to do now is kind of break the system down into this climax and attack or pseudomonas and fermenters and use the experimental data and set up the WinCF tubes or these bronchioles and try to mathematically model this. We've done this with um, pH. We're able to kind of reproduce the results of our experiment. We're also using um, antibiotics now. We have a, a drug that kills anaerobes or a drug that targets pseudomonas. How does this affect? And what I can tell you is that the oxygen stratification very much affects the outcome of antibiotic therapy. I'll put the equations up. It's really quite elementary, obviously. So metabolomics, right? I talked a bit about that at the start. You know, we were for a long time trying to figure out what the metabolome is telling us in all these samples. Uh, I did a cross-sectional study. We published this last year um, where I took just 100 samples from CF, 100 CF patients. And we're trying to see what do the clinical parameters and what type of microbiological parameters might explain characteristics of the metabolome. So we did an untargeted kind of clustering approach. This is a PCOA plot. I can't imagine I need to explain PCOAs to this audience. We found there really are two types of metabolomes in CF. You're either in cluster one or you're in cluster two. If you're a patient walking around, you have one type of metabolome or another type of metabolome. And there is a spectrum there. It's not truly binary in that sense. But what we found is that these two clusters actually also have different microbiomes. This climax and attack pathogen anaerobes system. 
So the pathogens are more abundant in cluster two and the anaerobes are more abundant in cluster one. And sure enough, this also matches their clinical parameters. This is a measure of their lung function. So the people in cluster two have more pathogens, they have lower lung function. And it's very well understood that as patients get older and their disease progresses, they have more pseudomonas, it takes over their lung. That led us to the question, what is the difference between these two groups? It turned out to be peptides. So I just tweeted about this to, um, uh, I can't remember the fellow's name now, asking about um, peptide metabolome microbiome relationships. We find some interesting contrasts when you look at metabolome and microbiome that you know, talk about if there's questions. The difference between these two CF patients is the abundance of peptides. It doesn't appear to be anything special about these peptides. They're just two, three, four, even 15 amino acid long pieces of proteins. Um, and they were very much more abundant in cluster two, the ones that have all the pathogens and all the more sick. <coughs> Again, if you're reading the literature about CF, you'll come across this enzyme called neutrophil elastase. Um, CF lungs are absolutely loaded with neutrophils. It's probably the most inflamed place on the planet, if you think about it. Um, Neutrophils, when they come with them, they bring with this enzyme in their granules called neutrophil elastase. So thinking about peptides, perhaps they're sourced from this enzyme. And what we are actually able to show, including by sequencing the peptides with mass spec and their terminal residues, particularly match the cut sites of neutrophil elastase. So what's happening is this enzyme is coming into the lung and chopping up, probably pretty arbitrarily, um, peptides that is trying to kill bacteria and it's chopping up even its own cells. And that's why we see those differences. That's why we pick up all these peptides and people that are sicker. Well, what might that mean for this climax and attack model? Well, what we see in the metabolome, and I'm sure that the reason for that is because, and metabolomics is quite different than microbiome data in this way, is that you get everything with the metabolome. You're not targeting a gene that's only found in bacteria. You get everything. And the most of the signal that we get in our untargeted metabolomics is actually from host because there's far more biomass, there's more stuff from host cells in, the, in sputum than there is from um, microbial. So what we think is happening then is in CF, these neutrophils are recruited to the lung due to this intense inflammation signaling from uh, infection. They bring with them their granules that are packed with proteases, particularly neutrophil elastase. So how might this feed back to this kind of model that we have? Well, as I mentioned early on, we know that pseudomonas preferentially feeds on amino acids in the lung. So perhaps this explains its niche dominance. One of the biggest questions, at least for me in CF, is why does this sort of soil bacterium, and there's other soil bacteria as well, Stenotrophomonas, Acromobacter, Burkholderia, why do they seem to exist in really one place that's truly to designed to kill them? Like why do these environmental bacteria seem to dominate these chronically infected systems? Well, we know that Pseudomonas grows in these biofilms and has all these kind of physiological mechanisms to keep it from protect itself. And perhaps the reason it thrives there because it's basically bathing in its primary carbon source because these neutrophils are producing all these amino acids and it's able to, to survive and persist there. Too much time. I'll go through this kind of quickly. Clinical audiences always ask me, all right, fine, if this is true, then what can we even do about it? Well, the truth is, you know, I'm not sure which side we should be killing. Both are bad. Lungs should be clean. Uh, we want to kill both these systems and perhaps we can develop strategies to do that. So maybe to think of an antibiotic therapy, we could add a pH or bicarbonate, for example, that will raise the pH of the environment, select for a particular organism you're trying to kill, and then hit it with an antibiotic that's trying to kill it. The anaerobes appear to actually be pretty easy to kill. As I showed you, particular drugs seem to wipe them out. Maybe we just need to better understand which drugs do the best job there and how to kind of assess efficacy of, of anti sorry, anaerobic therapy. So back to the WinCF system, we also have been starting to do this. So using antibiotic tests in this kind of uh, simplified, but also very complex microbial ecosystem. What we did in the context of this oxygen gradient, I also added bicarbonate and tobramycin, which is a really a pseudomonas designed antibiotic to the system. And we're sectioning down the oxygen gradient, getting the sequencing data, but also metabolomics data. So what we found is that when you add bicarbonate to the top of the tube, so patients actually inhale tobramycin. It's like a therapy that they'll take like a puffer. Some patients also inhale bicarbonate. Bicarbonate made it to, through phase two clinical trials, time allowing here. Uh, CFTR is also a bicarbonate transporter. The idea was we need to replenish bicarbonate back in the lungs. Some CF patients I, bet, I met absolutely believe in this and still take it, makes it feel, them be feel better. But it fa failed in phase two clinical trials, perhaps because it grows pseudomonas. 
So as I mentioned, if you raise the pH, you'll get this pseudomonas growth, and we see the same thing in this system. It decreases the diversity in the upper layers because you get lots of pseudomonas. Tobervisin seems to pretty much wipe out pseudomonas, although you hear about a lot of resistance. What's great about this kind of multi-omics approach that I encourage you, if you're not multiing your omics, what are you even doing, right? Um, is we get information about the molecules as well. So tobermycin's penetration, we can track into these samples. It, even though it's highly hydrophilic, it doesn't diffuse all that far, only about halfway into the system. And here's where the really interesting ecology happens, I think. You look at other microbes, you get these really complex death and survival responses in, in res to antibiotics. Streptococcus, for example, killed by tobermycin, although it's not supposed to be susceptible. And it thrives in the lower part regions of the tube because the antibiotic only penetrates so far. Look at other bugs like Prevotella that wasn't all that abundant overall in the original uh, control, blooms in the anaerobic portions of the tube in the presence of tobermycin. So perhaps there's a carbon source or some type of other um, thing that Prevotella needs that another microbe is taking up and then gets killed. Sure enough, Prevotella takes over that niche, is able to grow. We see this type of thing all the time, including with the pathogens. Stenotrophomonas maltophilia is another emerging pathogen of CF. Arguably the most antibiotic resistant microbe on the planet. It seems to be resistant to everything, certain strains. You hit the system with tobermycin, you get blooms of steno. So there's a niche that's been vacated, right? And if there's lower abundances of stenotrophomonas, it seems to take over and it's somehow resistant to tobermycin. Go over this kind of quickly. Um, in the 16S data from this experiment, three patients had a lot of reads to the aspergillus mitochondrium in the upper layers of the tobermycin therapy, really in the only in the aerobic layer. Yeah, that's pretty interesting, a bit of a tough sell to a journal that we've got aspergillus mitochondria running around in the system. How could we show that? But again, the metabolomics really helps you. So you have this aspergillus abundance through depth, perfectly matches the abundance of a molecule called fumatrimorgin, which is a metabolite produced by aspergillus fumigatus. We actually detected eight different metabolites from uh, fumatrimorgin, or from fumigatus in these aerobic layers. We can verify that aspergillus fills the niche as well. This was actually reported in clinical trials for tobermycin, that some patients that were inhaling it had really bad fungal overgrowth and fungal blooms in their lungs. But I could have told you that because if we took pictures appropriately enough, there were fungal hyphae at the top of the tube. So kind of moving, changing gears a little bit, you know, one of the things I'm thinking about is sort of modernizing clinical microbiology. I'll give you an idea of why you might want to do that. So in 1881, Robert Koch developed the uh, agar petri dish culture method, which we still use today and is a vital aspect of any microbiological lab. In 1928, somewhat by happenstance, Alexander Fleming had the notorious penicillium spore land on his petri dish and wipe out the lawn of Staphylococcus aureus. Now the point I'm trying to make is almost 100 years since Fleming, we're still doing this the same way, right? We're still screening microbes with antibiotic discs. Um, with very much the knowledge that it's more complicated than that. However, you know, if I get sick and, you know, if I did go to the doctor for this plague I'm experiencing right now, very much, please culture my bugs, put them on the antibiotic discs, diagnose. This is the way that's done and it's validated method for doing that, right? But perhaps we can start to think about how to integrate microbiome and metabolomic data into the, the clinical environment. We're trying to do that. So we've really expanded on these WinCF approaches. Uh, this is new data that I got yesterday from my lab, which they're proud of because my lab is very new. So New independent data is fun. Um, again, we're doing this WinCF system with high replication. So we've actually done this 45 times, but here's 18 samples we had. Um, where we're growing the microbiome in WinCF against a panel of antibiotics. So we have 10 different drugs that CF patients are giving to patients. We just wanted to see what happens, right? Like who lives, who dies in this, in this uh, competitive world. What the early data is showing is there's actually quite a lot of community level resistance, which we're unsure if that's actually due to antibiotic resistance or perhaps just these drugs aren't very good antibiotics. Um, some drugs really tr uh, change the system. So miropenem, for example, uh, is an anaerobic drug. And can't emphasize enough, if you're doing clinical type of microbiome work is to talk to doctors because they can tell you information that you don't necessarily get from literature. Uh, the physician I work with told me that they don't like to use miropenem because they're worried that it will get resistance. It is the last resort for CF. It's like an atomic bomb. This antibiotic is a really, really good drug, and they don't use it unless patients are essentially about to die. Uh, and you can see that. It just wipes out the anaerobes, and you get lots of pseudomonas and staph. 
you do see amoxicillin. So we see things we expect to see, um, anaerobic drugs, killing anaerobes, but then this is sort of level of resistance from the control that we're not really sure what's happening. We have to look probably into the chemistry and likely the genetics in these samples about how to explain resistance at the community level. So with the last like five minutes I have here, I'll talk a bit more about um, sort of the, the omics picture of cystic fibrosis. Um, we know, and it's very much said in the literature, that the CF microbiome metabolism is personalized. I don't really know what that means. I mean, nothing's the same, right? When you're measuring a thousand things, no microbiomes are the same. Um, it's true, you see personalization. So on the left here is a PCOA plot of the weighted unifract difference, colored by six people. This is 600 sputum samples collected through time. So I uh, got tired of going to the clinic. I said, you know what? Would you guys wanna just maybe collect your samples at home? So see if patients are throwing their sputum in the garbage every day, twice a day. I said, no, I'll just put it in this freezer. I'll ship you a freezer and then about nine months later, I had 600 sputum samples that wouldn't fit in our minus 80. It was quite the challenge. And this is what the data looks like from these six people. Yes, there's personalization. See that yellow person is very different than the rest. But what we see is that they periodically become very similar to each other. They're moving very dynamically through space. And to me, this was a remarkable thing to see because the literature in CF, a lot of labs say that the microbiome is very resilient to therapy. We don't find that at all. There's huge dynamics that are happening and changes. You can see samples where they're basically on top of each other. Microbiomes are very, very, very similar. We also see that in the metabolome. Although there's more personalization, we think, in the metabolome than the microbiome, some people are also similar. We're not really sure why. What's happening in the microbiome is they're moving through this pathogen and anaerobe space. So you can kind of see that in these plots. So we color the samples. Sometimes they get dominated by their pathogen, but some, it's different pathogens for different people, but they all have kind of the same anaerobes. This is the more classic way of looking at that. You can see the changes that are happening in these people through time, particularly the person in the top left. First sample collected from this patient, she was actually on an antibiotic, and then the physician switched her to a strianam, right where you see the red start to show up. The red is Prevotella. So you can see the change that happens, and it stays there for about six months. You get sort of domination of Prevotella. We don't really know whether this is the patient doing better or doing worse. Um, we're trying to figure out what that might mean. And the patient at the top, it's dominated by Steno. You see these blooms of Prevotella. The first one associated with an exacerbation. The second one apparently was no exacerbation reported. So what might that even mean? But the point I'm trying to make is that these communities are highly dynamic. And we're really trying to develop, and I think the microbiome field in general, methods to quantify and visualize uh, longitudinal data. And here's an example of a video. So what I'm showing you here in this plot is those hundred samples. This is kind of the microbiome space of CF, if you will, colored by the percent of pseudomonas. So some people are absolutely dominated by pseudomonas and others have really none of it. <coughs> this kind of spectrum. If you follow these, uh-oh, might have froze. getting unhappy. Follow these people through time, you will see these large changes. We plot the x-axis as time. Some people don't change much at all. So watch this orange trace really kind of stays in that pseudomonas space for the most part. This patient actually died during our collection. It was just taken over by pseudomonas. The last few samples were like 99.9% .9 pseudomonas reads, essentially a pure culture in this lung. And there's other people that have these dynamic shifts and they stay there and then they come back. Well, we don't really know whether it's associated with health, disease or what, but I think that anyone that believes that the CF microbiome is not dynamic is wrong because <laughs> we see major, major changes. So I'll just kind of leave this idea here. You know, we're really using microbial ecology approaches and, and systems biology, if you will, to understand the truly clinical questions. And that's um, a lot of what uh, we're gonna keep doing. Another beautiful picture from Dylan, uh, and I'll take any questions. Yeah. So I had a question about the sources of the, the peptides that you, that you were seeing there. So have you tried mapping when you saw like that those increases in peptides mm -hmm. 
you tried mapping them back yeah. to yeah, we absolutely the, did that. the human genome or yep. whatever? Yep. And the most abundant peptide was uh, calprotectin. Okay. So calprotectin is the most abundant protein in a neutrophil. Its granules are packed with calprotectin. Calprotectin is a, a cation binding. It's a chelating protein, particularly for calcium. They use it to keep microbes from getting uh, metals. So it made a lot of sense, right? They're, all these peptides are uh, coming from neutrophils. The elastase is producing them. They're even chopping up, they're cannibalizing themselves, right? This prote protease is so rampant. There's other proteases as well. But they're chopping up host tissue, host proteins. Calprotectin was very abundant. Um, neutrophil elastase itself, <laughs> getting reads to neutrophil elastase, whether it's from the proteolysis or not. But, so we can do that with the mass spec data. Yeah, so that's because what I'm wondering is how much is the mucus layer itself contributing as a, a resource for these bacteria? Since that's a, that, we see that it's a very important resource. For yeah, it's a great question. So the mucus in CF is very screwed up, right? But it's still this super high carbon load. So Ryan Hunter, who is a colleague of mine, has shown that Mucin is a carbon source, at least in the laboratory. We don't really know how much the microbes feed on it in the lungs. It's hard, hard to know that, right? But what they show is that um, mucin is this interesting molecule because it's a kind of linear peptide coated with these branching sugars. But those sugars are mostly recalcitrant to break down, except, for example, so Pseudomonas cannot break down mucin. So the big bad pathogen of this disease doesn't feed on the major carbon source that we think is in the lung it doesn't have the enzymes to break them down. It requires the anaerobes first. So the anaerobes actually take the sugars off and Pseudomonas eats the protein backbone. Brian Hunter's lab showed that. We don't really know. I mean, one of the issues with metabolomics is that you do these extractions. So metabolomics is not only comprehensive that it can sample everything, but you're also very selective because you have to extract things from metabolomics and you're biasing. So we usually use methanol. The mucin is not extracted in the methanol. So we don't really see it. We pick up some sugars sometimes, but so I don't really have an answer for how much they're feeding on it, but in the laboratory, we know a lot about it, and Ryan Hunter's lab has shown that. So I have a question related to the phage therapy. Are there, mm -hmm. Is there phage therapy? Absolutely, being absolutely. So just before I left, um, uh, Doug Conrad, who hopefully is on this slide. Oh, I feel bad now. Thank you, Doug Conrad. Um, is actually uh, kind of leading this, not necessarily on purpose. So um, UCSD has been a bit of a pioneer, sort of by chance, in phage therapy, mostly because a professor there, well, I guess probably probably not the story with the, um, I asked what was the microbe, that, with an A, help me out, that almost killed him. He got infected in Africa and then phage therapy cured him. Can't remember the name of the pathogen, I guess it's not that important. Uh, as a result, UCSC has kind of blossomed into this phage therapy leader, and CF has been a major aspect of that. So Doug Conrad is treating his CF patients with phage, primarily that Forest Rower has isolated and other people. But it's probably not the best place to do that, because the, lung, the CF lungs are so loaded with microbes that a phage therapy, I think, is more going to work better in acute conditions, right? You need to wipe, like an antibiotic, you need to wipe out a bug. It'll be hard for Doug and the people doing this to assess efficacy because the same problem we have here, it's like, well, we can see microbes get killed, but does that necessarily mean the patient got better? They're never better. They're always got CF. It's a hard place to kind of understand, but very long answer to your question is yes, they're doing that in CF in San Diego. So, so related to that, then looking at your, um, your columns, and you know the, the fact that well in this idea that in the lungs you also have these gradients um is it is it also the gradients that might make it difficult the phage therapy yeah possibly um so that paper went through review at science and we had some constructor reviews and the main critique was that well, we don't really know if this is happening in people and it's very difficult to show that. We would have had to get an explant lung, and we could have done that. We subsequently decided to publish it elsewhere. Um, so I don't really know. And the reality is that the patients are coughing their mucus up all the time. So this is a mixing system. Some of these bronchioles, I mean, your lung is a tree, right? So what's happening in one little part of the tree is not necessarily the same as happening in the other part of the tree. Um, we think these types of gradients set up, but whether or not it's just constantly like that, I don't think so. It's probably remixing and then kind of stratifying and remixing and stratifying. So I don't know how much that would affect phage therapy, but 
you know, even just therapy in general. I'm not sure. So CF patients from different parts in the world, do they show different? Yeah, them? yeah, actually it's become very um, like important for me moving to Michigan. Uh, in San Diego, we have lots of trouble with stenotrophic bonus. I don't really see that in Michigan, it's Burkholder area. There's geographical differences, surely due to weather and soil, uh, the exposures. We're kind of interested, one of the biggest questions is like, how do they initially become in contact? Or why do they get infected with Pseudomonas? It always seems to happen around their kind of early teen years. Some get them earlier, which is not good. Um, but it's not like they're not exposed to Pseudomonas through their whole life. I mean, every time we go out in the soil, they're a kid playing in the soil and in the water, you're surely Pseudomonas originosa is everywhere, right? Um, there likely is something that sets up a changing mucus buildup in their lung that sets up. It's all about niche availability, right? And that niche probably isn't set up until their earlier years. Um, and then the availability of microbes in different geographical locations definitely is different in patients around the country. Is that true of the anaerobes too? No. Everyone has the same anaerobes. And it's because they're coming from your oral cavity. We all have relatively similar oral cavity bugs, right? It's not an external source. We just submitted a paper on this to the Journal of Cystic Fibrosis. We mapped the microbiome of a whole human, uh, 50 CF kids. We see pseudomonas on their skin. We see it in their feces rarely, but the anaerobes are everywhere. The same Vianella parvula, Prevotella melaninogenica, lives in your gut, lives in your oral cavity, and it gets in the lung. So there's a real ecology there, but it's a real fascinating question. Why pseudomonas gets there in the first place? Why does it happen at the time that it happens? Why not right away? We don't really understand it. Mm. Yeah, I mean, clinicians care a lot about the fungi. Uh, regrettably, I think some people like myself in the microbiome field probably hasn't cared enough. Uh, we haven't done a lot of work on the fungi, but it's a very much a clinical problem. A lot of patients take antifungals, um, but you know, there's a lot of people that study like Pseudomonas aspergillus interactions and things like that in the laboratory. You see some interesting metabolic exchanges and stuff, but not really sure how relevant that is in the lung. Mm -hmm. well, I see that you had a patient that had E. coli. And yeah. Is that like an extraintestinal pathogenic E. coli? Uh, oh, great question. <laughs> now, how much time do I got here? Yeah. So that patient has probably the only CFTR mutation in the world that's never been seen before. She's a bit of an oddball. Um, it's not unheard of to have CF in the lungs of patients. Uh, I will tell the story. So the person I showed with the early WinCF study that passed away, uh, we published in um, MBio four or five months ago, the story of his death. So long story short, um, we were in Colorado at a CF meeting and he got a severe exacerbation, went right to the IR and the physician came home, we came back and, and treated him. So he was really doing badly and he hit him with antibiotics and I guess he got better for like two days and went home and then got way worse and had blood in his lungs and came to the clinic and died like three days later. We were scrambling to get samples. So we collected samples when Forrest, I was at Peter Dorsey's lab at the time doing metabolomics. Forrest collected sputum, did transcriptomics, metagenomics, trying to turn this data around in time to save his life. And we were too late. Um, he died about like two days before the transcriptome data came back. The metabolome data was ready and waiting. We can do metabolomics in like two hours. Um, what we found was that the transcriptome, uh, we'll try to make this story short, and I'm not sure if this is even true. We'll never know what really happened because we weren't very organized at the time. We ran a whole program to do this at UCSD that I was leading and simply kind of stopped. But there were reads to a enterohemorrhagic E. coli uh, in the transcript, in the transcript and in the metagenome and pseudomonas and some other things. So an EHEC E. coli got into his lung. Sure enough, in the metabolome, I detected what's called global ceramide, which is the uh, GB3, the Shiga toxin receptor, in the sputum. It's the first time I'd ever seen it. I'd never seen it before. It's the sphingo lipid that we detect in the metabolomic data. So that was an interesting connection, and they subsequently analyzed this data, and I'm not sure if I believe that it was necessarily true. It, there wasn't a lot of controls. It was a frantic effort to help this person. Uh, but the argument is that, or the story is that he, they think he got infected with EHEC E. coli, um, the physician treated him with the antibiotic, which killed the E. coli, 
But the problem with Sheikha toxin, or maybe, is that it's not ex excreted from the cell. It's stored inside the cell. So the antibiotic was a, a bactericidal, lysed all the E. coli, shot all the Sheikha toxin into his lung, blood everywhere, he dies. We see, and the Sheikha toxin actually induces the expression of the receptor. So I'd never seen it before. The Sheikha toxin may be induced expression of GB3. There's a story that this EHEC coli essentially killed him. I don't think we'll ever know if it's truly real or not. I mean, I think that, that was probably an answer to your question. I think that really quickly, the reason I ask is because I know there are extra-intestinal E. coli, like urinary pathogenic E. coli, and that in like birds, they actually cause like respiratory issues. Huh. So I just wasn't sure like what. It's kind rare of to have E. coli in the lungs, but not un not un unheard of. And younger, we from this paper we just submitted, a lot of the younger patients actually have it. And I don't know if the clinical labs are picking that up, but we see it quite often. Okay, thanks. Well, there's no further questions. Let me thank you.